Hey, what's up, guys? We're coming to you from the Better Call Botto podcast studio. And of course, we are presented by Hardhide Ponchatoula Strawberry Whiskey. And if, you know, you were to get struck by lightning or something, you would probably want to have a hard hide. Hard hide Ponchatoula Strawberry Whiskey is an 86 proof blend of three-year-old wheat bourbon, American light whiskey, and fresh Ponchatoula strawberries blended in New Orleans. It's not for the thin skin. Look for it in your favorite st stores, bars, and restaurants. And if you need legal help with any of the following 18-wheeler collisions, car wrecks, offshore injuries, Maritime and Jones Act, hurricane and storm claims, you better call Botto at 504-323-7777 or 985-303-7777 for your free consultation and case review. And as always, check out our friends at uh, the Firehouse Subs location on Veterans Boulevard. We are going to be there on December 10th in the afternoon. Make sure you come by and check us out. Two o'clock doing a Q&A. Mike's going to be there. DJ's going to be there. I'm going to be there. Sue's going to be there. we got the whole team uh, pretty much coming out for that event. So come out and support our people. Meet us, ask some questions, whatever you want to do. And uh, we got a great show for you guys today. So we're going to get into a bunch of different topics, some of the team's biggest needs heading into next year. What do they got to do to beat the Bucks, And a whole lot more. So let's get to it. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the New Orleans Dot Football Podcast here with Mike Triplett. DJ's in the back. Uh, Mike, let's just start off right away. Have you have you been avoiding weather? Are you safe? Is your family safe? Is there any anything that you need to to come out and say? Like, is everybody good? If the Saints don't you beat, buzzing? if the Saints don't beat Tampa Bay, I think we're gonna need to pull off some <laughs> sort of like our Nick and Mike okay stunt to get people interested over the last five weeks yeah. of the season. Uh, we're not dying. We're just dying to cut prices, hit our latest sale. Hey, the Black Friday coupon's still open too. I haven't closed that yet. So if you want to save 25% off your first payment, New Orleans at football forward slash subscribe, check it out. Um inadvertent advertisement right there. But I like I guess, that. yeah, I guess maybe they're the best ones. You're Look, shrewd. Here's the here's the good news. Right now we're podcasting. And we were podcasting about a relevant football game in December. Going to the box playoffs are still alive. What are you? What are your thoughts up for uh, Monday night? I am willing to not laugh at that sentence until we see this game on Monday night. This is it. All the marbles here. If the true story of this Saints team is that they are actually about a 500 level team that that is just needed health. Well, here you go. H health is not health can't be an excuse anymore. Um, Assuming Marshawn Lattimore plays and and is at least ninety percent of of Marshawn Lattimore, um, the defense has been getting healthier all around. I don't think Pete Werner will play, but Kate Ellis is doing his best Pete Werner impersonation. The Buccaneers are hurt everywhere. Uh, Antoine Min Winfield might not play. Um, you know, Fournette might play, but he's banged up. Uh, um, I'm forgetting a big one that's out for them too. But um, you know. And so all the marbles are in this. If you beat Tampa Bay at Tampa Bay on Monday night because you're saying it took a while, but we finally got our act together a little bit, then I'm willing to entertain the idea that, okay, maybe maybe we can talk about you deserving to win the division. They lose. We're, we're done talking about math. We're done talking about 2022 for the rest of the year. We're only talking about 2023 from, from then on. So I'm, I'm willing to give them one chance to say, all right, is there something here or not? The wildest thing about the season is like, I think Marshawn's injury is probably the one that we probably point to the most, their pass defense right now is allowed yeah. 197 yards per game, which would be the best mark since 2013. And you could maybe say, okay, they were behind in some games, but if you look at the ratio of first house, first half passes versus second half passes, it's basically the same as 2013. Like they've done a pretty decent job of defending the pass. And we've kind of shot at them a lot um, in the secondary for some of that stuff. And I think some of their biggest mistakes came there. They've been okay. The flip side to that is how much better could they have been maybe with some different decisions? Like if they still had CD in the slot, right. would it be a little bit different? Marcus Williams instead of Marcus May, would that make a difference? But they've been surprisingly okay at defending the pass with really a really awful 
pass rush this season. I will say though, yeah, and and speaking of the awful pass rush, Tristan Wirfs is the other player who who's probably going to be out for the Bucks. That's a huge one uh, that could hopefully help the Saints pass rush. Even though we know Tom Brady gets the ball out in like half a second, but. Um, I will say this, though, for the secondary. I think the pass defense has been really good. And when Dennis Allen said that Monday, I was like, yeah, he's right. That actually hasn't been their downfall this year. But the two biggest problems for this defense all season have been missed tackles and not forcing any turnovers. And those both fall on the secondary. Yeah, and- the, most of the missed tackles have come in the second level of the defense from the secondary. And, and there's just no playmakers making game-changing plays yeah. in the second. And then the other part of that is one of the spots where they do kind of get gutted a little bit has been in the slot, yeah. and that was a self-inflicted wound. So Cincinnati, it, I can't get over that yeah. Cincinnati. W- within context, like the numbers look great, but then yeah. when you kind of contextualize them a little bit, there have been a couple letdowns, and they're self-inflicted letdowns. And some of the tackling errors are because of players they brought in and let other players go. And so, I mean, there's definitely a lot of things they got to do to get better. I think they have a shot Monday night. I mean, just they yep. always have a shot against the Bucs. And like you said, getting guys back, having Marshawn back, I mean, that's huge in, in this game. There's no bigger move. Like, if you could just have him for two games a season, it's these two yeah. games. He he really, I've said this before, like, Mike Evans probably has a really good shot of getting into the Hall of Fame. And when that day comes and he's on that stage in the, in the gold jacket, I'm just going to kind of be like, Marshawn's going to really? tackle him on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> like, Marshawn has made him like a like a wide receiver, too. Like, he's just a, a regular guy yeah. in these games, and he's one of the best receivers in the league. But it's just, it's kind of hard to feel that way about it. Um, But I think if they go out there, they keep playing hard. Like, I think they got a shot to win this game. They're going to match up well because they always do. And and I'm going to write about this this week, and, and I've mentioned it a couple times on the pod already, but this is this has got to be DA's moment. DA has been a punching bag all season. DA is bad at a lot of things that a head coach has to be good at. He's had missteps trying to talk to his quarterbacks and tell them what their role is going to be and, and, uh, and, you know, being too lax in the preseason and all this. Um, but here's how DA can save his reputation. Uh, Come up with the right plan against the Bucks as a defensive coordinator, which is what he did to get this job in the first place. So, uh, a lot on the table for him in this game too. Yeah, he's like he's got to save himself here. Yeah. At, at this point, is it's on the defense. The offense can be what it is. If your defense is good and it has to be in this very particular game, it, it's yeah, it's everything for him. And I think I honestly think if they lose this game, there's still the element of them being alive that I think is keeping them playing hard. Like the players still see the playoffs in front of them. As crazy as it seems, that is something that they're still fighting for. You talk to the guys in there, they bring it up. Yep. They acknowledge how insane it is that they're still alive, but they're still alive, so there's something to play for. If you take away the element of anything to play for, I think that's where things maybe start to go sideways. And if there were something to lead to a one-and-done situation for this coaching staff, it would be it going off the rails and, and you know just getting smoked by by Cleveland, by uh, Atlanta, by Carolina. Like if you if you go off the rails after yeah, this, I agree. that that's when you're you start to be in trouble. You win here, guys keep playing, you keep people bought in, and maybe there's a bright spot and you can sell it to the locker room. And it doesn't matter to the public if you're selling it to the locker room. All right, we got guys back. We're starting to see our potential. This is what we can be, and they believe in it, even if they don't make the playoffs. That's how you keep your team alive and you keep your job. If Da beats, if the Saints beat. Their three division opponents in the last five weeks, no matter what they do at Cleveland and Philadelphia, DA keeps his job if they beat. And and so <laughs> there's probably a bunch of torn listeners right now being like, well, maybe I don't want him to beat because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I know how many people are against him. But, uh, you know, just beating Tampa, Atlanta, and Carolina makes you a seven win team um, and, and finishes, finishes the season on a decent, you know, you finish at seven and 10. <laughs> there, there becomes a narrative probably in January, or February, like, Wow, with all the injuries this team had, this will segue, I'm sure, into our next topic. But seven and ten was actually not that bad. Like, so those are the three they got to win. Before going to that topic, let's let's hit this one real quick. If if Andy wins on Monday night, does Jameis ever get his job back this year? Yeah, I don't think so. I, I think that's on the line too. I think I think well, first of all, if Andy wins, that means he had a good game in a tough environment at Tampa Bay. Um, so there's, he's probably playing well in that scenario and there's not going to be a rush, but it also means you're a half game out of first and, and who knows tied for first when you come back from the bye. I don't even know who Tampa plays next week, but, um, so, so you're going with, they've gone with Andy this whole time because they think he gives them the best chance to win that week. Uh, that's not going to change if they're a half game out of first in the NFC South. So of course, but the bigger question obviously is if Andy lose or if they lose, you know, is this Andy Dalton's last start? Even if he doesn't play poorly, um, 
And, and I think that's very much on the table because I think after the bye week, you have to start really looking at 2023. You have to evaluate Jameis at some point and decide if he's part of your plans for 2023. If And we said this, I think, on the mailbag this week. If they never turn back to Jameis this season, I don't see a possible scenario how he's back next year. Um, I think both that would show they don't trust him from a performance standpoint. They don't have confidence in him. And it would show that their relationship is probably beyond repair behind the scenes. The only way Jameis plays in 2023, I think, is if we start to see a, a sort of mending of that relationship before this season is over. Yeah, I agree with with all of that. And look, I, I know like we both agree that they should have the evaluation period. I would rather be watching games with Jameis Winston in them. You know, just my personal. Yeah, I want to see my, what it looks like. Yeah, my personal curiosity as a as a fan of the game of football, I think it would be more exciting. I, I still, everything we talked about this offseason, I still... There's part of me that still wants to find out. Like I want to. There's parts of me that still think that, like, okay, with the right players around him, can he be better? Can he can he do yeah. this differently? Can it look like this? Can they be more play action based and and take better advantage of his big arm than they did last year? We don't have the answers to any of those questions. They might feel like they do internally. I can't speak to what they think though. Like from our seats right here, I want to see it. And and I think that they. Might have had a better shot of winning. Like, I, I think blaming Andy Dalton for the last game is crazy, but I still think that there's a handful of... Jameis has, like, the, well, what if he made two plays? Yeah. And that's it. Like, he could make 19 bad plays, but, like, what if there are two good plays and you score on both of them on a 67-yard pass to Rashid Shahid and you find Chris Olave another time? Like, there's there's always that to it. And when you're playing from behind, that's part of it. Uh, Tampa plays the 49ers, and then they play the Bengals. So if there was a scenario where their season went sideways... That, I mean, it, it kind of sets Those up. Those are the little very bit. next two games. The very next the two games. So, yeah. like, there is a very real scenario where the Saints come back from the bye tide for first place if they just win this game. Yeah, that, that's a tall order, but but you know, we'll, we'll, <laughs> it'll be a very different conversation that we're having during the bye and after the bye if we're talking about a team that forget everything that happened for the first three months. Now they're relatively healthy and tied for first place. Then you know, it changes everything. To finish the Jameis point, and this isn't me reporting it, it's not my opinion, it's just looking at the situation and kind of thinking, like, what are they thinking? What's the side thinking? Yep. Part of me kind of feels like the Saints have already made their decision on 23. I don't know if you go through this whole season the way it is. Jameis told us he was healthy and he could be playing. He's not playing. So I kind of just feel like... And then Jameis being upset about it and publicly upset about it, it kind of feels yep. like it's out of... I don't know that it's fractured, but it's it's at a fracture. There's something point. that needs to be repaired yeah. there. Yeah, the concrete's cracking. Like I don't know if it's you know you got the the sinkhole yet, and there's nothing left, but it feels tenuous. One scenario that I, you know, look, I, I don't know how much truth there is to it, but I, I mean, I felt like they were close to going back to him Pittsburgh week a couple weeks ago. Oh, they were, and he was. I, we can't put a percentage on it. Let's say he's was 75 or 80 percent healthy. And I don't know if he balked at, oh, you're just going to throw me out there behind three hurt offensive linemen and just throw me to the wolves. Like, now you're turning back to me. I, I don't know if that was going on at all. But if they do give him the opportunity to start a whole month later, I think he's closer to 90% healthy. And the matchups are better. And the offensive line is healthier. I think there is a scenario where, I mean, he's got to be chomping at the bit. To He doesn't want the first three weeks of the season to be the last that he puts on tape this year. I, I think he's probably going to be really eager to be a healthy, the healthiest version he can be of himself playing against some favorable opponents with a healthy offensive line in front of him. And and so I think there's a lot of of benefit. And and I agree with you. I, I don't I think there is very much a scenario where if the thing Jameis had to fix in his game, quote unquote, or prove he could do, which we never really got a full chance to see was the things that the Saints obviously value because they've praised Andy Dalton for it all year long, which is quick on-time throws to the first uh, read in the offense uh, and staying out of trouble. Jameis said that was the number one thing he worked on all offseason. I think we could see that, but he could also unlock Chris Olave, who only has three touchdowns this year. Maybe in, in the final five games, Chris Olave has three more touchdowns with Jameis. You know, I mean, maybe he gets him the Offensive Rookie of the Year award. Like, I'm not just talking about, like, neither of us are talking about stunt deep throws, like, you know, his 70-yard touchdown pass to Deontay Hardy. He could, he could be the best thing that happened to the, 
you know, best receiver on their team. Yeah, the red zone offense, too. I think something about having a a big arm in that area of the field where you can really kind of like rifle a pass in between coverage and condensed quarters probably makes it a little bit easier to get touchdowns to guys that aren't Jawan Johnson. I mean, there's there's things that he's clearly going to do better than Andy Dalton. I think there's a handful of things in Andy Dalton's game that are a little bit better than Jameis's, too. But we know what those are. We know what the offense can be. They are a four and eight team. You know, outside of the Arizona game, I think he has done a pretty good job of avoiding trouble. I mean, what he has seven picks, three of them in that game. Um, you know, I think if Jameis had played this whole stretch, you know, I don't think he has the same efficiency numbers that he had last year either. There's just been issues with this team. But I want to see what he can do. I want to yeah. I want to find it out. In a season that, I mean, you know, inside they feel like they're still alive. On the outside, I think we all assume they're they're dead and not like the pop-up, like, hey, you know. I don't, I, I don't completely way. agree with that lessons. I'm not trying to be rose colored glasses, Pollyanna, but I mean, we just said it. If they beat Tampa Bay, three things happen at once uh, or two things have three things happen at once. They're a half game out of first. They just won on the road at Tampa Bay, which would be a huge win. And, and they go into the last month healthier than they've ever been. Like you can call it a joke or whatever, but they, they absolutely should be all in to try to win the division. If that happens. You're a true believer. All right, you're back. No, but I'm saying you're back. You're bought in. I'm saying you can't. You can't. No, I know. You I'm, can't I'm pretend you. like it's a joke. You have to pretend like it's serious at that point. You really will be it a actually, half game out of first, it actually is and serious. you really yeah. will be playing your best football. So even though you don't deserve it, it's your reality, and you should go for it. Yeah, I mean, it is real because like <laughs> the, the division is just that bad. It's just it's a joke that that yeah. we're still having these conversations, but it, it's it's real. I mean, it's just. That's kind of where it is. Like, so if you're on like Rotten Tomatoes, you have to see one of three movies that got under 10%. Like, you have to go let see me one. Ask like, you one this, gonna get in. Let, let me ask you this, though. Here's the real question uh, that, that divides the two things. So let, let's take a team like the Cincinnati Bengals last year. I, didn't they start off below 500, 500 for a while? They got hot in November and December, and they go all the way to the Super Bowl. We've seen that happen with teams before that started slow, uh, shoot, the, the Saints in 2017 started 0-2 and, and they gave up 1,000 yards in the first two games, but we thought they were one of the best teams in the NFL at the end of the season. So let's say the Saints get in on this technicality that they just happen to play in a division where eight wins and an eight and nine season can get you into the playoffs. Is there any use in talking about the Saints as, you know what, oh, I once they're healthy, <laughs> one, not that they'll make a long playoff run, but once they're healthy, they're actually kind of oh, they're, you they're you're not making bad. Me, you're making me think that it's like possible. No, 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 at- no. I don't. I, I'm saying, is it possible that this 2022 Saints team has a not like might not be that bad? Are they not yeah. as bad as their record says? I don't actually know the answer to this I question. Think it's I see a lot of warts. They almost beat a bunch of good teams. Like they like yeah. it, the, I see all these teams at the top of the standings, and I'm like, man, the Saints were in like Saints beat Seattle. Should have beat Cincinnati. <laughs> they were in the game against Minnesota. Should have beat Minnesota. They, 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 is, awful as last week's game was there's a scenario where they don't make mistakes and they're competitive more competitive and they were competitive in the game even though they were shut out i mean yeah. th- there is a, a possibility of them but that's the nfl as well i think every team in the league outside of like three or four looks at it like man if a few things went different yeah. and, and that's just the league but just i do, I do wonder way. i don't i don't have conviction on this which is why i asked you there were other seasons, even even like 14, 15, before we had to admit, okay, this team's never coming back out of this malaise. Because those were still prime Drew Brees and Sean Payton where I thought, geez, if they can just get out of this rut, they're that was all the 14. Sean Payton, Drew Brees-led team. I don't care if they have to win the division at 8-8. Eight and eight. If they make the playoffs, they're dangerous. I, I don't. I don't know what this team's ceiling is because we haven't seen anything close to their ceiling. Like, I don't know if they even have one. I don't know if they're a team that might be good enough to scratch out 20 to 17 wins if everything goes their way or if there's like a really good version of this. I mean, we saw it against the Raiders. That was the one week where I was like, oh, there's an actual good team in here. I didn't know that existed. And then it went away so quickly. Yeah. (laughs) I think looking back on it, like 14, I believe, like if it was like, man, if this team just stops being stupid, they could win, they could win some games. I thought 15 was kind of bottoming out. 16, I had more belief than 15. 16 felt more like a rising. Like there was optimism about that draft class and some of the guys playing well, Mike Thomas. Uh they, they started to put some pieces together. I don't know what I what I believe this season. I believe that they could 
if they're fully healthy and we see some signs over the next few weeks, like I could get to a place where I'm like, man, they could, they could win a game. They could win a game. Marshawn is a, a huge yeah. key. Marshawn yeah. is such a huge key. Like, and then, and then Werner should be back after the bye. I mean, like the problem is, is we'll I have see. trouble. Yeah. I have trouble believing that like they're going to put it together, but yeah. if they do, no. maybe, maybe, yeah. but I mean, I wanted to talk about all this because if they lose to Tampa Bay, we can never have any of these conversations again. <laughs> oh, man. They're going to kill us in the YouTube comments for the next topic. But I mean, I think it is a, a real one and it, and it has to be addressed because we were talking about this the other day at practice and, and DJ, get your mic ready. I want you to take on this one too when we get to it. I think it's, I think it's, when I look at this team, the way that they keep losing makes me look at the coaching staff and say like this should be different they should be doing this different why aren't we seeing this like we talked about some of the stuff on the last pod some of the the accountability could they step in and do different things here and there but i think there's a reality where if they looked visually different you could sit here and say hmm i wonder how much different it actually should be and so the question i posed to you guys at practice the other day if you told me in august yeah chris harris is your starting slot receiver and i say or slot slot defender and I say that acknowledging that that's a self-inflicted wound that they created, that they put him there. But if you told me in August, Chris Harris is, is the slot, and I think you blame DA for some of that too, like that, that Chris Harris is in the slot because the CD Deuce thing went sideways and, you know, whether yeah. it's manageable yeah, 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 or yeah, not, yeah. it goes on the coach a little bit. Um, so you tell me Chris Harris is in the slot, Mike Thomas isn't on the team basically, and that Marshawn Lattimore is going to miss – I don't know, 65, 75% of the games this season, and that Andy Dalton is a starting quarterback. Because, what their, because Jameis had two major injuries in yeah. the first three weeks. What is, what is their record yeah. on December 1st, 2022? Well, and, and look, Alvin got hurt for two games that they lost early in the season where he could have made a huge difference. Marshawn gets ejected from that Tampa Bay game. They could have won that. Like, like, But I think even without any yeah, of that other yeah, context, like yeah, there's more on just top those of it. Things, yeah. what, what is their record? Um, yeah, I think their record is what I would expect it to be, which I've even said, and and I uh, no shame to Sean Payton, and this is not a DA defense. I've even said if Sean Payton was still the coach, I don't think they'd have that many more wins either because last year we saw all these horrible things happen to this team, and Sean Payton lost five straight games in the middle of the season. There was nothing he could do either when he had no offensive line and no quarterback. I, and and I've also said I I think it's still true because we DJ and I were talking about this we couldn't remember or he told me Pittsburgh ended up being favored I think they have been favored to win four games and favored to lose eight games this year so four and eight is what their record should be now here's my take on DA none of this is a DA defense this is sort of like Mike can you watch my can you house sit for me and if nothing goes wrong. You're going to come back and your house is going to be in good shape. If the house is on fire, I'm going to be like, oh, I don't know where Nick keeps the fire extinguisher. I'm going to throw a bucket of water on it. You're going to come back and I'm going to be like, the, the house caught on fire and, and I couldn't fix it. Like, I'm not giving DA credit. I'm not giving, but I'm just saying, like, if all this stuff didn't happen, he could have probably been a good caretaker. When all this stuff did happen, he didn't have the solution. So I'm not saying he's a great coach. But I'm saying even a great coach would have struggled to win more than four games in this scenario. I, I probably would have picked him knowing they didn't have Peyton and knowing they didn't have Drew Brees and knowing they didn't have Teron Armstead and Marcus Williams and Malcolm Jenkins. I'd have probably picked him to be four and eight if you laid out all the injuries they've dealt with this year. DJ. Yeah, I'm in the same thing. It's four and eight. Like I was talking about this weeks ago, but just Marshawn and Mike. Like, if you tell me that at the beginning of the season, and then you have a Debo, missed a few games, Jarvis, like, you're lucky to have four wins, maybe five, but, like, four wins is probably where you're at regardless. I think I'd probably give them, just looking at how this season has played out, like, I, I feel like there was one game where I felt like they could have they could have won one more somewhere. They were close in a few. Yeah. And I felt like Cincinnati's there were a couple, the one that still. Yeah. I felt like there were maybe a couple coaching things where, yeah. like, if you throw Sean in there, that, that they probably win another game. I, you know, I, Sean might have found a way to to gut it to 500, like in the yeah. most incredible yeah, type of, course, of way, like he course. did in, in 15. But the circumstances are hard. And that's kind of the whole point of, of this conversation. I, but again, I think there's a lot of things they could be doing different. It could look a lot better. Some of the wounds are self-inflicted. Um, the decisions in the secondary to move on from, you know, Marcus Williams, I think is a factor in this. And that's that's a DA decision. Yep. He's He's the one. He's a secondary coach. Like he built the secondary. And yeah, they've performed well. We talked about the numbers earlier. I think that's one CD being gone's one, but yeah, it's, it's impossible to think that this team 
we overvalued them. Like we didn't see how bad their interior defensive line is. It's awful right now. Anyamata has taken significant steps back. I think we kept giving him the benefit of doubt. And it's just kind of like the guy that was on the rise just isn't isn't there right now. Um, but I mean the the injuries on top of that, and I this is a conversation for another day, and I want to do like more study on this topic itself. But I think the interior d- defensive line has made things harder on everybody. Like I think there's stuff getting through there now that like Tyron Matthews trying to clean up that it starts in the front and there's plays coming to him that if there were a different line, like they wouldn't be coming to him. So I think a lot of their issues really stem from those spots right there, not being what they thought well, they were going to be in no pass rush. Let me go back and say this. And, and this is my biggest criticism of DA and the coaching staff and the organization as a whole. I think if you told me to list the seven things that they did worse this season, all of them are before they kicked off in week one. Oh yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so the conversation we just had is you said, if we were talking in August, all right, in August, we probably felt like maybe this could be a 10-win team and then all these bad things happened. This guy got hurt. This guy got hurt. We didn't even talk about them losing three of their five starting offensive linemen at, at Pittsburgh, which should have been a gift on the schedule. And Instead, that was their ugliest performance of the season, I think, at Pittsburgh. Um, so, so all of those reasons are why I said four and eight. But they, personnel decisions and DA's like, approach to the offseason all deserve tons of, of yep. rebuking because i think pretty much every personnel decision they made except for chris olave has backfired um you know they, they didn't make the right decisions at quarterback obviously in hindsight um although i guess you could say bringing in andy dalton as the backup re- kept their season afloat to some extent um because james got hurt so early but tyron matthew hasn't been the answer letting marcus williams go and thinking you wanted to switch to Tyron Matthew hasn't been the answer. The C.J. Gardner-Johnson trade has obviously backfired. Jarvis Landry hasn't been the answer. Bringing in two older guys hasn't been great. Um, just, you know, like all the personnel decisions. And then and then D.A. not treating this like, I don't care how we used to do things. We're starting from the ground up. We're going to work on fundamentals. We're going to take this up. We're, this is not a continuation of what it used to be. The whole That was the whole organization's approach rehire the entire coaching staff continue on the same path and since we were nine and eight last year we're going to be better this year just because we're going to be healthier that that has all backfired and and you know that everybody deserves blame for that yeah my biggest regret is someone covering this team is like we're standing on the sidelines at training camp and being like da summer camp this is like we aren't seeing any of these guys play late stuff like I didn't. I don't think I, I it, it raised to a level of concern for me that it that it should have and it I think that's kind of where everything stems from is just kind of the whole approach to the whole summer. And then into the season, we kind of disagree a little bit on some of the, you know, how hard you go on fumbling and false starts and stuff. But I just think that general softness is something that's kind of been the defining characteristic of, of his opening stanza. As far as everything we said about these injuries and where they should be and his expectations and all that stuff, like getting Marshawn back, getting Pete Werner back, getting these guys back, it goes from here now. So Anything from that excuse or, yeah. you know, I don't even think it's an excuse, just using rationale to kind of explain some of the circumstances, that, that is eliminated. So they have to get better yeah. from yeah. here on out. So If they stink over the next five weeks, then there, there is no more. There's no more excuses. Yeah. And yeah. there's barely any now. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, it's yeah. just kind of, it's kind of at a place. So I'll where, tell you who I'd like to get back on this team, in addition to everyone who's been injured, is the ghost of Marcus Davenport needs to turn into the Marcus Davenport who wants to secure the $20 million contract or whatever he's going to get in free agency, because I'm a little concerned that this pass rush has disappeared. We're probably not going to see it Monday night, to be fair. The Tampa Bay does such a good job of avoiding that. Tom Brady's going to get the ball out twice as fast as he normally does without having Tristan worse. But um, remember when we were talking about how Marcus Davenport had emerged as the best player on this defense? If if he can have a monster December, that would help too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he probably needs a solo sack or two to get the contract he wants. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I kind of, you know, I think he's, I think he's still probably going to get paid by somebody because people pay for pass rush, and he yeah. does that a lot. But I mean, I, his his, I think yeah. his value is plummeting. Like it's yeah. very bad right he's now. He's not having the same season as Onyemata. Onyema, and you watch the tape, so you can speak on this better than me. But he's a I just, I just see it live to the naked eye. Davenport hasn't necessarily become a nothing player no he's there he's um, just not finishing but yeah but he's i think his last two seasons were way better than this one yeah oh absolutely yeah. you got to finish you got to yeah. finish at some point there's a difference between you know 
the idea like pressure and everything like sometimes i think that that you know it's a little bit swayed too much towards like ah these almost plays don't count but like you can't have almost only plays you got to have a little bit of both yep. and then you know i think over time you see that that level out with people like if you're getting there a lot you get some sacks but this is this is crazy i mean there's something there's definitely something a little bit different there's something going on that he's not finishing these plays i did a story a few weeks ago though his time to pressure and all that stuff were, were almost exactly the same as as last year it's just it's not happening for him and it it's a little bit it's a little bit weird you know i think there's probably an element of taking someone like Marshawn off the field, like where yeah. you're getting that press and disrupting a little bit more than than maybe you were with the Debo when he was playing through an ankle injury and all this stuff. But that's uh, you know, throughout a whole season, it's a little bit crazy that you exist in a place where this guy who's supposed to be the best player on your team, yeah. who everybody swore was the best player on the team, intelligent people outside of this team thought he was the best player on the team, and now he's he's not getting anything done. I don't yeah. think he's a nothing player, like you said. It's just right. It's a little bit outrageous that that it's going on. It's been a lot of almost plays for Cam too. I mean, they're they're kind of having the same season in in a certain degree. I don't think Cam has has like you know hit the wall at age thirty two or whatever he is right now. Uh, but it's been too many almost plays for him too. And I'll tell you what, I I don't know if this is the chicken or the egg in the conversation that we're having. But also, if you told me the Saints were going to have the worst turnover ratio in the league by four. Four worse than any other team in the league. I I don't think I would even predict four and eight. I'd probably predict uh, two and ten. Um, and that's stunning. I mean that that is a product of them not getting a good enough pass rush and not having enough playmakers in the secondary. But also there is a little luck involved in that. It is stunning that this defense absolutely can't fall backwards into a takeaway. When's the last time they had a takeaway like London? <laughs> like it's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, no, it's been really really bad. Um, all right. So you look at the twenty twenty three team. And kind of just touching on some of the stuff we talked about, some of the weak points on the the roster. Let's go kind of back and forth on yeah. this. What is your number one need going into the next season? Well, my number one priority is mapping out what I want to do at quarterback. That doesn't mean I I have to draft my quarterback next year, but like n- nothing else matters until I figure out what my plan is. Now, if their plan is just bring back Dalton and don't waste money for now. And that, and we're going to have Dalton types until we draft a guy or until we, you know, target a guy like a Jordan Love or a Tyler Huntley, both who are a year away from free agency. I, what, like, whatever it is, planning, mapping out what your plan is at quarterback is, is number one. And then, and then you have to turn the page before you get to everything else. But, looking at the reality of their situation without a first round draft pick and without like an obvious answer coming in free agency, I'm going to assume that we're looking at either an Andy Dalton or a Jameis Winston or at most a Daniel Jones or maybe some other version of a Gardner Minshew. I don't think they're going to have a superstar quarterback. So I think they're going to have an okay quarterback and then figure out where they can be exceptional. But you know, I'm, I'm making sure we don't ignore that that, is the biggest decision that everyone in this organization has to make. God, if they're running it back with Andy Dalton, I might be at a college game every Saturday scouting right. quarterbacks for the but whole season. But I mean, that might be what they the have Saints. to do since they yeah. don't have a first round pick. You can't force right. it. It like we can say they need to upgrade at quarterback, but how you do it? I'm just saying it's a yeah. hideous. Re- it's a hideous reality. Like yeah. if that's where yeah. they're at, it's going to be. Or, a hideous or season. like we've said, it could be Teddy Bridgewater. It could maybe it's a younger guy. Maybe it's Daniel Jones. Maybe it's Gardner Minshew. Maybe it is. Um, you know, like whatever it is, I, I, I'm kind of intrigued by Tyler Huntley, but I don't even know if he's going to be available. Uh, like, but I don't think there is a, oh no, they're going to solve their quarterback issue by, you know, going out and getting the $40 million guy or the first round draft pick. Well, I, I don't know how they do there, either there's one. There isn't yeah. a $40 million yeah. guy on the, the market. I mean, it's, yeah. it's Daniel Jones, Jimmy Garoppolo. Well, I mean, like how somebody kind of, traded for a Russell Wilson sure. and then paid him 40 million. Like, I, I don't see that happening and I don't see them getting one of these top 10 quarterback draft picks so let's say they do get a sean payton pick at 17 uh from the chargers or they take one in the second round that isn't necessarily being someone who's written in pen as your week one starter either so I, yeah, yeah yeah but at least you have that yeah you you i would have love that. to see that that, yeah. that would be what i want to do now if you I, have andy dalton or you know teddy right. bridgewater and yeah sure that would I, be my number one choice like if you told me i could do this on paper I would pick, and and let's say they, you know, don't get the Sean Payton pick, or I don't know, but like, 
whoever is available 20, I, I'm not going to pretend like I know, but that's they have 30 people in their scouting department. I would be like, pick one because in this year's draft class, there's so many of them that if you find one, you really like you, there probably is a little value there. Last year, there wasn't any value because they were all like fourth round. You know, you had to take Kenny Pickett in round one, even though nobody seemed to have a first round grade on any quarterbacks, but that would be my path. But it is so hard to force that you can get in more trouble trying to force that than, than you can. But that, that would be my number one scenario is that, that they do that, that their first draft pick is on a quarterback. It's just so much easier said than done. Yeah. I mean, you can get in trouble passing on them too. I yeah, mean, you know, yeah. you, you take the small school pass rusher instead of Lamar Jackson. I mean, you can end up having yep. regrets. So, I mean, it's, yep. it's the same way. Um, if they like somebody, you got to try them. Like, if, that's if, the if anybody's even close, if yeah. anybody is within 30, if they're, if they have a second round grade on someone, take them in round one. If they have a third round grade, take them early round two. I'm just saying, don't don't take this year's Garrett Grayson or yeah. Ian Book in round oh, yeah. one. You know, yeah, I mean? no, I don't, and I don't want to hear like you know years from oh we loved, we <laughs> loved like okay he ain't on the damn team like <laughs> that's great that you had a lot of players you almost picked that's that's fantastic you know the interesting thing with the draft to this draft process if Sean does get traded and they are picking at 17 I think there's a really high chance that they're making that pick with somebody other than Jeff Ireland like I almost would bet that Jeff Ireland ends up going wherever Sean goes. And that might up the the premium package too. Like if it, that's known and knowing that you get Sean gets you, you know, and I think Jeff's done a really, a really, really fantastic job yeah. scouting. I mean, there's been a couple of years where there, it was down 2020 was a, a weird year. Ruiz has kind of saved that a little bit, but if you get Jeff and a guy or Sean and, and a guy that drafts a little bit better than everybody else, I mean, that's a real way to kind of restart your your franchise or get yourself back on track. So, well, what Jeff does so well, why Sean would want him is he is excellent at drafting to the team. Yeah, like he doesn't try to be like we love this edge rusher. He doesn't necessarily fit what this staff likes to do, but let's make the yeah. you know square. Like he has a draft board that's like one tenth the size of everyone else's draft board because he wants to draft the players yeah. that fit the and, organization. So I'm sure Sean would love that. And Sean's got kind of an insular guy and Jeff speaks his language and they yeah. fit together. And, you know, I think yeah, he probably so wants to be a, a, you know, a solo GM at, at some point. Um, all right. Going to the, the, the next need. I think I would, I'm not saying this is the, the highest positional value. I just look at the team and I think, all right, Alvin's probably going to be suspended yep. next year. Mark Ingram's really, you know, kind of kind of at the end. We haven't seen anything from him this year. He might have another year in him or, or not, but they need a running back bat. Without question. Yeah. It's a must. Like, so the Saints always say that there's musts. Musts? Must needs and wants. Needs? Is needs the second one? Yeah, must needs and wants. Musts and needs feel the same thing. But anyway, that's a must. It's in the highest category. I also agree. That's not where I want to. Ideally, I don't want to use my first pick, especially if I don't have a first rounder. I don't want to then use my second rounder on a running back. I don't necessarily want to spend my precious cap dollars on like Josh Jacobs or whatever. Uh, so I don't know that that is where I spend my most money or my highest pick, but it might be the biggest need because there is no question they need somebody in that role that can start for however many games Kamara misses who can split time with Kamara and then who can take over for Kamara in a year or two. It's absolutely. I mean, maybe that is, maybe I just talked myself into using the, whatever the 40th pick in the draft on that. Yeah. So like the must needs and wants, like a must is kind of like, you can't field a team without yeah. addressing this position. And that would kind of be running back right now. And need would have been like last year where, all right, we want, uh, we running want, back was a need last well, year. <laughs> we want, we want Trevor Penning. We want a player, a young player to develop at that position. But if we don't get them, we're fine going into the season with James Hurts. You can still feel the team. I think that's kind of where the difference is. So like Penning wasn't a must. He hasn't played all year, obviously. Yeah. So clearly he wasn't. So that's, that's so kind of the difference. You described a need by saying we want, we want. That's why I don't know. <laughs> well, so, must, so like, there's something between must and want, but yeah. you, you, you must eat. You want pizza. No, I know. I'm you know saying what, I mean? what is need then? <laughs> need, a need is kind of, the, I, think it's, I think it's just need, two levels. Running back was a need last year and, yeah. and I, they acknowledged it and they didn't fill it. So that, that's the thing. A must you fill no matter what. Yeah. It all comes. Uh, a need, you know, you need it. But if you don't fill it, you kind of throw your hands yeah, up you, and be like, it didn't happen. There's, yeah. a, there's still kind of, you know, quarterback and running back were both need last year. And they when you don't fill a need in 2022, they become a must in 2023. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of you can uh, get by. Well, my next one is there. the entire defensive line. Sure. I mean, I mean, <laughs> it's all of them. It's scary. So here's the thing is 
I, I still think it's going to seem crazy, but I still think I wouldn't be surprised if they reinvest in Marcus Davenport this offseason because they know how good he can be. They know how good he is when healthy. Uh, they will know how healthy they think he can be, and they know how important that position is. And if you let Marcus Davenport out the door now and then Cam Jordan is like a year or two away from not being a full-time starter anymore, then your cupboard is completely bare at defensive end. And meanwhile, we know they have a glaring uh, defensive tackle is currently a must. Um, so that's really scary that like you need to add a couple of real blue chip build around players at, at end and tackle. Yeah. I mean, you know, that I got nothing to add to it. Um, wide receiver. They got to get a wide. They have one good wide receiver right now. Everything they did this off season, they have one good wide receiver. Mike Thomas is obviously still on the team. I, I shouldn't talk about him like he's gone, but I think he's probably going to be gone. Yeah. Um, so they have, one viable wide receiver right now and wherever Mike's at, whether you think he's going to be great again. And I personally do think he's going to be a good player. He was good before he got hurt. You can't, count. you can't count on him at this point. And you and can't that's pay just, him yeah. his full price. Right. He would have to agree, as we've said before, to either a pay cut or an incentive based contract to stay. And we'd have to see where their relationship is. And I just like Jameis, I don't know if the relationship is beyond repair where they're both going to be eager for a change of scenery. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Can't, believe we're talking about receiver i thought they were set there i thought they were going to be set there but the good thing is that doesn't have to be the they're not going to be the team that spends 20 million on christian kirk they need receiver depth they have their number one yeah i I just draft another guy honestly i think i think the draft is the right way to do it you got uh you got anything else like my last one i kind of got slot defender listed i mean i think that's probably alante taylor long term um but you know he's got to develop and and show it but that is something that they got to figure out um Maybe not, though. I mean, yeah, I, I'm not going to put that as a must. Certainly not slot no, defender. But it's, yeah, it's something yeah. they got to answer. Yeah, um, they should. Uh, is CJ Gardner Johnson going to be a free agent? They should go after that guy. <laughs> um, and then Philly will get a comp pick. No. All right. Um, well, I'll say uh-huh, the good it. news as I'm scanning through everything. The good news is you you do feel good about their young talent at corner with Lattimore, Adebo, Taylor. It's nice to not have cornerback be a must. Um, safety. I, <laughs> They could run it back with Marcus May and Tyron Matthew, but that's a position where they probably need to go in the draft and and get younger. Um, Offensive line, it never hurts to invest, and I could see them parting ways with Andrus Pete, but I'm not going to put anywhere on the offensive line in the must category since they just reinvested in McCoy. Ruiz has become a thing. Trevor Penning, obviously, they invested in. He better be the right answer at left tackle. Um, So I think we've gone through all the musts for sure. I mean, they could literally address every position. Yeah, it, it, it to, yeah. to some degree. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, we're going to have this conversation in the future, but we're going to do this in reverse, and we're going to say who is, who is, who who is your foundation? And there's going to be some names we're excited about, like you know Pete Werner, who's come along, and Chris Olave and stuff like that. But the foundation is going to be, you know, less less star studded than it used to be. Do you resign, uh, Caden Ellis? I think so. I think so because when you hear Dennis Allen talk about him, he, he's not just talking about the kind of player he is. He, he he's, or I mean the the production that he's had, but you know, his energy, his development, his buy in. Like and every time he does an interview, he talks about <laughs> DA yeah. in the most glowing terms. But it reminds me of the 2016 Saints where Sean Payton was talking about the energy of the young players and that picture of the sideline and the guys you want to build around and and. He keeps mentioning Kay Nellis keeps mentioning Alante Taylor that way too, as as guys who are, this is the way we want to play defense and they're doing it. Yeah, look, I, I I'm kind of glad that he turned it on and figured it out because I understand the pick of Zach Bond now. Like I see the vision of it. Like you get the elite pass rush stuff at the linebacker position, and they can do all these different things, and they went with the inside moves and outside moves, and it's a, just a different type of pass rush. And I think that might be maybe part of the harder part of the equation. So you move them off the ball, you get that, and then. You teach an athletic guy how to see the field. Obviously, that didn't work with Bond, but Ellis is the same old college uh, defensive end. I so think Bond make, has another year. It could be Bond next year. It could be, or you can make the argument that Bond's maybe one of the worst picks they've they've made. But I at least get the the theory fully now. Like you kind of see it, and it's like, oh, that was supposed to be him. That's what they were trying to do, and they actually already had the guy in the building. I I think the most interesting thing over the next five weeks is what they do at linebacker. I think there's an argument for. Depending on the direction of your team, if you're saying, all right, we're kind of realistic about where it's at next year, you got to take a little bit of a step back to keep going forward. All right, who's part of the picture going on? If 
Caden Ellis keeps playing the way he does over the next four or five weeks. And I think there's still a possibility that like a door opens up underneath him and it falls out. Like I'm not fully convinced that, that he is this guy, but you have a hard decision you have to, to make figure it out that, to get him that position. Yeah, he has to be on the field. Yeah. And look, I mean, the simplest solution might be play more base defense with three linebackers on the field and 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 no nickel corner on the field. Um, obviously this team plays like 90 plus percent of their snaps in nickel. Uh, so, so maybe, you know, we're not talking about a drastic change there, but, but that's one obvious solution. Have all three linebackers on the field that could improve your tackling, could improve your run defense, which have been two big problems this year. Um, and, but the other one is probably just rotate. I mean, Pete Werner is probably going to take a little while to get back up to speed. Demar Davis is older and could probably use the rest. Um, but I mean, there's no question that Caden Ellis is going to get his 30 snaps a game and they'll figure out how to do yeah. it. I mean, I don't think it's super hard to find ways to get him on the field in pass rush situations yeah. too, where you know yeah. you're going after him. And, and he is probably their their best pass rusher right now at linebacker. Um, he they, was they doing were, that a lot earlier. He was. That's how he was getting yeah. a few snaps here and there. He was playing Sam linebacker, but he was really playing edge rusher. Yeah, I mean, I think the bigger question here is what happens next year if he's a real player and you do spend you're gonna have to spend some money to keep him if he keeps us up like he's gonna have somebody else that wants him if he keeps playing the way he is i don't it's not a probably a mega deal or anything like that but no you're gonna have to but invest probably, in him in a, in i mean a frankly more real, that decision is probably tied to a demario davis decision yeah i mean no it is absolutely and um demario is such a bargain and i feel like having demario on your team for one more year at a bargain rate is not a bit of it but there'd probably be a ton of trade value with DeMario too. Yeah, it's it's a big thing that they're going to kind of have to figure out. I mean, Caden Ellis is, is the bright spot on the season, even though they are still playing. I will say this, though. I could see, you know, flash forward to one year, the, the Nick and Mike pod in November. So what went wrong? But when they decided they didn't need DeMario Davis anymore <laughs> oh, yeah, because no they had Caden Ellis, no that could be one of those Absolutely. what went wrong moves. Absolutely. <laughs> but if he, if he were to keep yeah. this up over the rest yeah. of the season, that is a decision yeah. as harsh as it would yeah. be. Like this guy, I think, supersedes a lot of stuff. Like, you know, he's on the field and the community, all of, part of the culture of the yeah. team. But I mean, I'm not if, in a hurry to let him right, out the door. Right, right. But if Ellis keeps it up, I mean, it is something where I would, even if it ends up being wrong, I would understand the rationale behind why they were at where they were at um with that decision uh that's all that's all we got for you guys uh make sure you check out our sponsors hard hide punch tool strawberry whiskey it's in local stores um if you need to sue somebody call botto uh and check us out at firehouse subs next week or if you're being sued right yeah we can whatever, help you with that too whatever you need you better call <laughs> botto um so thank you guys for listening and we'll uh be back with the members only after the game